so <clears throat> okay i guess we can continue hi again um my name is andre and i'll talk about control uh the next iteration of our efforts of generating a tool for symbolic execution or solidity <clears throat> so um basically with control we took a very popular um <clears throat> framework called boundary and the EDM semantics of K, and we've combined them in a tool that is able to perform symbolic execution on Solidity smart contracts. And um, <clears throat> it's especially useful for those who are not verification engineers. So basically playing uh, Solidity uh, developers, um, and it also leverages already developed test suits of Solidity smart contracts. So um, I'll go a bit into detail, like a short presentation for Foundries, this uh, blazing fast popular toolkit developed in Rust in which developers can have their Solidity project. Um, it has an automated management of compiler versions. It has um, this ability to write tests in Solidity, which can be fast. Basically, you have your test, which has arguments. And when these tests are executed, those arguments are fast with random values. Um, <clears throat> it's also nice because it's very fast. It runs uh, thousands of tests in a few seconds. And it provides users with immediate feedback when it's failing. So basically, a counterexample. Um, the problem is that. <clears throat> Uh, even though there are no false positives, meaning that when a test fails, you have a correct counterexample that is basically will lead you to the failure. You it can produce still false negatives, meaning that when a test is passing, it doesn't necessarily mean that that test is correct, but only that it wasn't able to find or to fast value that would um, cause a failure. <clears throat> um, and then we have the. EVM semantics is the formal semantics of the Ethereum, Ethereum virtual machine developed in K. Um, it passes the same conformance test suit as other clients. Um, it enables us to do symbolic um, execution of EVM bytecode, and thus we can use it for formal verification. It's um, where the, we've, we've been using it for some time in um, formal engagements, and um, it's online you can find it at the jello paper or on our GitHub. so yeah um so going back to control now that i've presented this description of um how the tool is composed um the idea is that we've we're looking at four triples and we've been um using them for property verification in solidity basically for all variables there are preconditions and then there is the code we execute and then we can uh, look at the post conditions so <clears throat> by using control we can insert these whole triples in solidity by basically saying that we have a test of a property and we declare the variables um, as function arguments we can insert the um preconditions with the assume keyword we can run the code and then we can assert post conditions using the post keyword <clears throat> um so this makes use of the foundry's capability of write of writing tests in solidity and the evm's cap capability of uh, doing symbolic execution um this is just a basic example of a contract um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the Solidity language, but basically it's a contract similar to a class. It has uh, properties and functions, and for a given number property, which is an integer, it has a function that would set a number, uh, and it will take another Boolean argument for whatever reason. It will most likely set the new the number, the property, with the value from the function argument, but if in some special case uh, the number has a specific value and the other boolean is true or there's a specific condition then we have this backdoor that will revert um, 
So basically, when we fuzz this, there's a very unlikely chance that the fuzzer will not take this path. Um, <clears throat> and so what control does is that it assigns these symbolic variables for the function arguments. And basically, at each uh, split or if case, it's going to take all the cases. Like it's going to ask itself what's happening if you go to the left side or what's happening if the condition is uh, not right. Um, and so by running control or this example, <clears throat> it will take some time. It's not as quick as the uh, concrete execution, but I'm not sure how clearly, clearly you can see. Uh, after some time, it will identify uh, all the failing nodes, like all the possibilities to the symbolic execution, which the execution can fail. And in the end, it will send the path condition that leads to the failure. And more than that, it can also give you a counterexample or a model for this state, saying that um, the contract or the execution will fail when these value, these arguments have these specific values. Basically. Um, and behind uh behind the interface what we're actually doing is that we're creating this uh control flow graph of k states where each node represents a state of the execution basically um for this example uh, we run the setup code we deploy the contract and then as i said earlier it will look at all the paths and will identify when we have a success case and when we have the age of the backdoor. Um, so yeah, this was like a short presentation of what control does. And um, <clears throat> there are um, some benefits, which I'd like to mention that beyond symbolic execution, um, we also have the interactive debugger. And now we have the symbolic debugger that Raul has been working on. Um, we can also use control as a bounded model checker and um, I wanted to reach these limitations that we currently have and how we've been focusing on working on them. Uh, the main limitation is that the execution is pretty slow. This example that I showed you can take for between 10 and 20 minutes, but as, sorry, as the code grows, um, it can take to a few hours. Um, also, another limitation is that we cannot claim for formal verification over the entire project just by running control. We can claim that we've symbolically executed and very formally verified the property that represents the test, but we cannot tell that we've run all the possible tests over a project. Um, well, you could do a set of all the possible, um, let's see. Can you do any kind of runs from the top of the box to say that you've probably verified everything? You still have to verify the box. Right? Yes, but the idea is that so you have a project that has a set of properties, um, a set of tests. Then the idea would be if you could negate that set and prove that it's empty, that will show that, okay, you've executed everything that can be like the set of all the properties of the contract. Those, those properties, they are symbolic properties, right? They are parametric properties. Yes. So that's what you verify. You only verify those, right? So you don't say that you formally verify the contract because, um, I mean, you need a specification, right? To formally verify the contract. So yes. there's the specification. Yes, but the specification is only, it only embodies that that, that you've seen or that you've written. But so it's you, parametric. Yes. But all, across the whole program. Yes. The entire project. It's a limited, right. it's, it's just one property, but it's still over the entire project. That's what we wanted to verify, that one property. Yes, but the point here was that you cannot like, say that you've checked all the properties and that your code is 100% correct just because you checked like there are still properties that could fail so this is not like a 
hundred percent guarantee that your form is correct just by formal. Of course, of course, course, of course, of course. But you know, there is no never a hundred percent guarantee unless you have a hundred percent. You should start with a hundred percent guarantee that your specification is right. <laughs> yeah. Right. So your formal verification is only as good as the specification. So here, if you claim that these property tests are your specification, then I think you can still claim that your project was formally verified entirely with respect to that specification, which That's includes right. these properties, right? If if you if the properties are not sufficient, then you may need to add more properties, more you know more. things to the specification, more requirements to prove. But I think that should be the vision, at least, underlying this uh, control tool, right? Is that you write specifications using this lightweight notation of parametric properties, which is much lighter weight than if you write them directly in K. Yes, that's right. right. And then control this transforms that parametric test in a full state. K, in a full K state that represents the specification. Right, that's how it's implemented. That's our business. But from a user perspective, these are the specifications. This is the specification of my project, these properties. And now control will formally verify the project against the specification. Yes, but with, with regards to this bullet point, I think the idea was if we can figure out a way, figure out a way to tell the users that they missed some properties. Or for example, we have an C20 and you want to look at the transfer cases and for example you write right. one or two cases but then there are still a few but that's that's always a problem when you do formal verification there is always this problem whether you specified all the properties that you want to formally verify right but that's not controls business controls business is to make sure that you can formally verify whatever you write down yes it would be nice to have additional tools to tell you hey there is some bytecode that has not been covered for example or there are some semantic cases that are not covered it would be nice to have those. ERCX keeps changing itself, right? We keep adding properties, right? But I think there should be, and, and we should all be on the same page, you know, as a team, that that's the vision underlying the control tool, right? So K is very powerful, but uh, it's heavy to use by non-experts in particular, even for experts then you can instantiate the K framework with one particular language, right? And, uh, and create tools like control where people write specifications using a more user-friendly notation, but somewhat sp specialized to that language, okay? And then there is the next level, which is ERCX, where you write no specifications whatsoever because they are already hardwired. I view it kind of different because you have your solidity code and you start with the RCX, generate those tests. But, so, but just a second, so that's for a particular kind of program, the RCX. Yes. Right. But we are talking about a programming language. You have a programming language. Oh, yeah. You write programs okay, in, in general, it. yes. Right? So the K framework allows you to define a programming language. And now you can write specifications, arbitrarily complex specifications for that language, yeah. but also much more general, yeah. right? Um, which cannot be expressed in the language using assertion for any other um, language specific notation, right? You can write things about the spec, the, the stack, about the heap, about yeah. lots of things, right? But that's heavy to use. But that's the ultimate power that you have. Yeah. Good. Now you pick a language instantiate the key framework with that language and now you think that language there is no other language in the universe except that language yeah. solidity right now you start thinking differently in terms of properties as well what yeah. would be a nice way to write properties for this language so that's all i care about and now we have tools like control that would be the idea with tools like control yes this is a very good way to write specifications for this particular language but you're okay, going which, which to take your you a very long way hmm? you're going into your pitch your presentation later, probably. No, no, no. I'm talking specific about this control. Oh, I see. Okay. Right. And then, once you have a nice specification environment for one particular language, like Solidity, right, then the next step would be, mm, wouldn't it be nice to not even have to write any specifications at all? 
right? Because that's how you have broad, massive adoption, right? Yeah. In, uh, with this user. That's how you catch users. Right, exactly. And that's when you come up with things like TRCX. Say, okay, so there are these templates, these classic programs, specifications, whatever, you know, that fulfill a very specific purpose. <clears throat> and for those, these are the specifications. You don't even have to worry about writing these specifications down. Yeah. Right? And I had this story, for example, in my city, there's a lot of developers. I mean, a lot of outsourcing going on. And the developers are split into two. There are code writers, developers, and testers. Testers are paid way less because they are seen as a lower class. And developers, they don't, worry, they don't want to worry about tests because they, it's beneath them. And uh, we can target those people, although this is wrong. You should write tests and you should think about tests even before you write your code. We can target those people. Hey, you write your code. We have the tests already for you. This is it. You yeah, but if you button. write the code to do a specific thing, an ERCX, yes. ERC20. But if you write your arbitrary, if you want to write an AVE, for example, like protocol, right? Lending borrowing. Yeah. Then you don't have those specifications. Yeah, you have to come up with those. But yeah, what I was trying to say, this is a product we can make. And we can hook people into using K with this sweet mm -hmm. thing. Hey, you can generate all those tests for you. you can generate concrete ones. We can generate. But uh, you cannot generate the tests ones. for them. You have the tests already for your Yes. Yeah. Well, so you can generate tests maybe with control. If you do symbolic execution, you see that certain behaviors have not been covered. Yeah. Then you solve some constraints and generate some tests. Yeah, you generate the counter example, which is very intuitive for the user because if you give them a very big property, that's going to be complicated for them. But if you give them a counter example, that's yeah. very easy to pick up. Yeah. All right. So we hijacked your presentation. Uh, um, all right. But the idea should be, you know, that tools like control, they, they are, is, you know, the way to think about them is a language specific instantiation of the K framework that gives, you know, developers in that language a nice environment where they can make use of formal verification. So, so I think the point here is that we shouldn't try to. Um, that, um, okay. And also another limitation was the fact that um, the user experience can be improved, mainly how we display information to the user. <clears throat> and so, um, I'll talk a bit about improving performance, uh, setting the aside, and like I'm, I won't talk about backend performance here. I'll talk about uh, how we can improve performance uh, of the proof. Basically, we already support parallelization of the all path which we do. We can run multiple tests at the same time. Uh, one of the other thing that we've been working on is the uh, branch exploration parallel. Go to branch instead of looking at each, each branch uh, separately, we'll do that in parallel, and that's been working on currently. It, we, we're actually testing this, and hopefully, we can get it much soon. And um, yeah, uh, when you do branch express parallel, do you combine them at one point and resume after? Uh, I think the idea is that you would start another um, instance of, of the server and then you would basically continue down that thread with different subgroup. So you don't communicate the centralized way in order to not support the same path? Uh, You're creating a graph, right? It is that. Yes, I suppose. I don't know a lot of details so, of this. Working on that? Uh, Noah is handling, he's uh, taking care of this. And on both of them? Both, uh... Uh, so the first one is already implemented. We support that for a while. Uh, Noah is working on the branch exploration parallelization, basically. And when you say that it's slow, you mean just one execution or the parallelization in the third bullet here? Uh, 
it's uh, the first bullet yeah it's still slow so the proof by itself can take a few hours by only the short dimensions of the code that's being executed just one part the i'm talking here about the parallel exploration of a single tool yes basically okay, well so a proof is basically a single test and we can run multiple tests at the same time basically mm -hmm. uh but the idea here is that in a single proof we can run multiple tests at the same time right. okay and that's not being done yeah that's being it's currently being tested but we don't all right. That's it. So that's that's super important to do. Right. Now there are all these fire machines that is the the floor not even look like a bench. So. Right. Right. Yes. Uh, and yeah. 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 But the first one is just that you can do multiple proofs in parallel. Right. So that's it was always there. Yeah. yeah. Anything, any any change at all in the total scale. Uh, So this for the which backend? Well, I think it's mainly addressing the booster backend. Because you're also looking more backend. Yeah. Again, uh, I I'm making the educated educated. I suppose like the most changes will still be in the like around here. Yes. Uh, the on the actual symbolic execution, it's working on it. It's working on making the execution faster. There's a hack to get it. Currently, I writing code. I think it's Sam Gil. That's for the task of that. Which is what we use. Like, we are not using the most. No, Probably the lowest thing in proof is still this second bullet here in terms of performance. Yes. Right? We need to split the uh, other branching. Yeah. The parallelized branching. Yeah, sorry for that. So uh, the third bullet is the one I, I'd like to address this time is. Uh, Basically, composability in symbolic execution. Mm -hmm. So, for example, <clears throat> if you have a function that calls has multiple external calls, basically, um, the symbolic execution of a function should be the same regardless whenever it's called. So, basically, if I have a function that calls, if I have a function that calls first a, that calls b, and then calls c, then after that, I call C again. Well, I'm basically duplicating the symbolic execution that's already completed for that function. So basically, I wouldn't have, there shouldn't be a reason for me to execute C. Plus. Uh, we guess that's a problem. And we've been, I'm sort of makes sense to avoid executing functions twice or multiple times. I think you like to do some profiling and then build a case. Say, hey, this call like a hundred times. We have this core property and I call this function C a hundred times two times. And each time I do exactly the same thing. And it takes 10 minutes to do it. I can waste a lot of time. So who, who's working on this? Uh, I am working on it. Uh -huh. Okay. And but do you need to do it in Haskell or do you do it outside? 
Uh, no. Um, I suppose we're doing it at this level. Yes. Uh, I think this comes back to the question I asked when we were and to give an example from part of the part of the the So the final result is not a tweak as the that. In fact, collapsing will share the whole together massive compression because you don't have to duplicate a lot of the So doing this, I think, is the prior. No, so the the idea is to do it basically when you build you, when you compile the solidity contracts, you then get the uh, ABI, mm -hmm. and basically you can look to the ABI and see identify all the external calls. So basically you can build this um, uh, depth layer basically. So on the first depth layer we have the main functions that we want to test, and then once you for the next layer, the layer of depth one, you can look at all the functions that the test example is calling. For example, that's the main set branch constraint A, A B, and C, mm -hmm. because it all calls them from the function. And then you can look through this ABI and identify, create this tree of dependencies. And then when uh, this should be done before starting the proof. So basically, this should be done in the Build stage. But isn't this equivalent to simply summarizing C, for example? When you to summarize C, you get uh, basically all symbolic execution or the symbolic execution generically for, for C. Yes, basically, that's the idea. I'm not completely sure how the summarize works, but once we have this tree, the idea would be. Uh, sort of, yeah. I mean, the question we need to understand very well the problem, right? And to be in sync, all of us as a team, that's what needs to be done. If, if, if there is any confusion, then we need to raise, you know, our hands and say, hey, it was clear. It needs to be clear. <laughs> Internet, otherwise, um, too much. So, if we have this effort, the KQG effort, right, and that goes its own way, and then you can rediscover it or do it differently for uh, you know, calling a function, then, you know, we are not analytically using what we do. Well, the proof would still use the KCFG, so we're not ready. We're not really at that point in the execution where we change the KCFG, basically. Mm -hmm. The idea is that we look and identify we break the main proof of the test into sub proofs that are um, basically the representation of these external function calls that we got as dependency. Mm -hmm. So the idea is we will start with the function that has the highest depth. We would run symbolic execution for that function and have a KCFG for that one. And the idea is to have a rewrite rule or a simplification lemma that we can generate for that entire execution. Mm -hmm. And then we would go, once we have a complete layer of depth, we can go to the next layer of depth and then when we are one or more because c for example is not that one rule like it could be lots of different cases also tcmg is a bunch of rules one for each edge like which uh, and all these rules together they summarize right the effect of that code symbolically that's what tcmg does yes so each edge is like combines a lot of straight lines of um, you know instructions with behavior with summarizes they summarize with one big group. And you have the branches because we have conditions, some of them take this part, others take this part, right? And um, and uh, in the end you may have a whole bunch of rules for something like C. Now imagine that C is like an if then else thing. Right? You have already two branches. Okay. So you cannot expect just a function will have only one rule. Uh, a function will be a set of rules. Yes. Because, but, you know, with some input, with some conditions, we take one part, and other to take another part. That's that's correct. But once you generate this set of rules, applying. Yeah, the rules. To, right. Then you want to do it once and for all. And now, whenever you, in different proofs, 
Now you may apply some of these to root, right? depending on whatever other conditions you have on the outside. Right? Yes, you exactly. But even then, it could be like maybe you maybe have 15 different rules, you know, summarizing or capturing the semantics of C. But now when you have some other, you know, context for which you call C, symbolic context for which you call C, right, you can only enable like five of them, the other can use it. But in context, you never involve it. Right? So, anyway, my, my point here is that the different tools that we have, like KTLG, um, you know, the summarizer, uh, you know, all these they work together, right? And, uh, and this is definitely one way to optimize to, to summarize the effect of, uh, of things. This could be like a compile time of the whole project, right? Take a project, compile it, right? Meaning that uh, you generate all these KPMG for all the various uh, functions. Right. And then once you do that, now any form of verification of the working position uh, instance, right, will, uh, will take advantage of that because you don't need to work. So that's one way to optimize. If you can go back, then go to the Yeah, right? sure. So the third point definitely is super important. Uh, I, I would just say depth. What do you mean depth? Because the idea is that we create this depth based graph of where you have the functions that are called mm -hmm. where each layer where each is structured based on that that's what yeah, the initial idea i think the, the basic principle the important principle here is to summarize the, the behavior the symbolic behavior mm -hmm. so, so that which is the kcd you know apply to the whole project I mean, the fact that, that you look at the depth, that's one particular way to implement things, right? But what really matters here, go back to the previous slide, right? And there are indeed three different ways to follow it, to improve performance. The first one is for free, basically, right? You can always start a new process to do your things. Right? The second one is to try right, to split into respective branches. And it's orthogonal to the third one, right? To summarize the effect of everything. And now we can summarize the effect of everything and we still do branch uh, parallelization. Uh, right, so this definitely needs to, to be done. So the second and the third. The third, we yeah, are not sure. Can you implement both of these or all three? The first one clearly, but can you implement both branch parallelization and um, this KTLG on top of? Whatever they can be have for the work institution. Can you take the peak level or the API level? Uh, that's the challenge, I suppose. The, Without going to have the formal. Yeah, we don't plan to go that deep into the backends. Um, the challenge, one challenge that I have, for example, is okay, once I have this summarization and create this new K definition of the K semantics of the C semantics, how do I inject that back into execution without recompiling everything that also has, uh, that also takes some time. And for the if you mean compile in the sense of K compile, it's a K compile? Yes. Compile the definition? Yes. Yeah. Because you also have to include the new rules into the main but definition. It's not K compile, why, 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 why is that? Because it only adds overhead, basically doing for Basically, for each depth layer, we have to recompile again. That would be. Yeah, but this is a big, a serious thing. You know, once you summarize the effect of a function completely, that's a, that's a big, that's a big scale up. It's a big scale up, yes, but it's worth, it's worth recompiling at that point. It's not, it's not the end of the world, but you have to recompile it. So you modify the step, you modify the mm -hmm. And if your compilation is slow, you say that.
Yeah. Because it's difficult to speak up. Right? Mm-hmm. You don't like something, say, because otherwise people don't know. Don't like mm-hmm. And we know how to prioritize things after that. Mm-hmm. Because I've been trying to convince people to do work on this, to work on that, but it's very hard to work on this project, it's not sure how to do it. Communicate is, is, is not good enough. It's just giving that. Mm-hmm. So complex. This is them. And yeah. how do we do it? Minimal examples. Not necessarily minimal examples, but yeah, minimal examples. Minimal examples. <laughs> yes. Um, Sorry. Yeah. So, um, I have a question about the so in yes uh i knew that there was um this api api to the backends which was able to inject modules but uh as far as i know it's not currently used um, but there's a possibility, yes, that it's not work. Okay, let's move on. I should be Um, so yeah, that's my presentation. Uh, yeah, these are very important optimizations, definitely, and uh, control is one of the critical products in the company right now, right? And um, I think in general for the whole team, the like the whole team, um, it is important to not get stuck and to not feel stupid to ask questions. Right? It's totally okay to ask questions if you get stuck. Like it's, it's better for the company to answer your questions and get you to unstuck you, okay, then for you to spend the whole day being stuck and frustrated that something doesn't work, right? And you don't even know if that has a solution or not. Right? So we need to find a way where what happens here in this room now happens all the time, right? That you get from there to say, hey, you can do that. I think I've done it. And, um, then you say, you know, but uh, I'm not sure if it works or not anymore. And then you say, oh, actually, let's ask uh, somebody, I don't know, but you know it. Right? So that should happen all the time. Sometimes there are days when there is nothing interesting being discussed on Slack, right? Um, and you don't know if people are stuck or, um, or uh, you know, everything works completely smoothly, <laughs> which uh, probably doesn't, it's not the case, right? So probably what happens is that Everybody's working on something and they think that you know, it's an isolated uh, you know, project. And in fact, you know, we can ask others. But, but it's also important to implement the right thing, right? Because sometimes you work on a small piece and you let the big vision was on the product in the whole, you know, not on tech, whatever you get. The risk is that you may redo what other things you did, and then that's also frustrating in itself, right? Because you may spend a whole week doing something, and then next week you figure out, oh, actually, it was done a few weeks ago. Yeah. And it was abandoned because it was a bad idea. It would work. I think said, what? So I spent two weeks working on something that has already been decreed to be bad <laughs> idea, you know, five months ago, and I didn't know about. Right, so now what I'm trying to do from the leadership level is to push a bit more structure into the company. Right, we want every single project to have two leads, like technical lead and the project or managerial lead. Right, and the managerial or technical lead also to be good uh, on the technical side. Right, but he's more responsible for the actual technology, he's more responsible for the roadmap. So if you want to get there, and here are the milestones, you know, this milestone. Is First of November, sometimes fifteen or fifteen November, two or two one one. Yeah, and also like fitting the piece into the puzzle because what I've noticed is that we have this pretty big stack of 
uh, one layer depending on the other. So there's like K on the base and then you have the semantics and as I said earlier, then we develop tools on top of each other and each tool sort of like depends on the one on the previous layer to work and function correctly. So. Yeah, I think it's changed something, one of the layers because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. more change. And regarding to you saying that the cloud structure, I think we we can achieve what you said out of the big picture and solve it for the features. We have to back here. One or two, even more, let's see what is done by people. Mm -hmm. The other one, one of the other things is the unstructured one. We just talk about the young club, and we need to talk about the weather, about the and then we say, Oh, I have this call. And there's no reason to say. I think that's good. I mean, you want it to be like that? Yes. To be more leadership there? Yes. Yeah. So you can, you can. Because there, but then, sometimes then, there are technical issues. Yeah, just technical problem. Okay. This isn't working for me. I, I right, but then, but then we should also bring it up, right, in the other channel where something can happen about it, right? So that it's not only a complaint, but it becomes. Yeah. I'm talking about having a meeting where it's not like I'm talking about whatever stuff. Okay. Like, like everyone was in the same room, physical yeah. yeah. Just the voice from where everybody can talk freely without any structure to the meeting, I think. I see. Okay. So, and you think you need more of it? Yeah. Yes, but it has to be an organic way. So it doesn't have to be something forced like, hey, at from 12 to 1, we meet and we have this uh, open discussion. So uh, I think that we should encourage people to use Huddle, for example, more yeah. frequently. and. To have open room studying to apply three or more people that work on the same topic. Mm -hmm. That would be a constructive way. Mm -hmm. That's an organized yeah. so yeah. organization. Let's have you know a beer, whatever to go yeah. right. And then uh, start feeling your problem right in the team. But somebody needs to take the lead on that. And also you like here in Google, you should come here and work here and argue with each other here. <laughs> and if you, you come once in a while, you know, I can yeah. sleep over there. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy. Yeah, yeah anyway. because 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 these meetings, you know, need physical presence uh, to to happen. Yeah, we do have we have one with speed front end and back end and we do too much. I don't think I've seen that one. Uh, and we just talk about that stuff. And it's the other Yeah, I think what you did in Paris when you put us all together, I think that was a very productive week for all of us because we were all in the same room. But that could happen every day. You have seven people here. The problem is in, in Jupiter's, I think we all are working very different projects. And uh, we talk to each other. I mean, we're general, well, we all, general now, and, and Andre, they're able to cover the problem where they talk to each other. Yes, we do. We try. We try it. Uh, but, yeah. I think there should be no but. I think we should work. Well, life we happens. Should, <laughs> we should actively work on that. We should actively make it happen. We try as much. I think in Jupiter's, we are quite. We are also friends, all of us, and we all spend time. And as you said, we go out, have drinks, discuss okay. about things. But then, up to a certain point, because yeah. We, but I was saying also, I think they also. We would like to meet and hang out with the others as well. That's the yeah, it's in Europe, for example, they can come here, you know, once a yeah. month or once every other month. Yeah, we yeah. suggested that. 
Yeah. I understand it's difficult because there are so many and what I think actually is what is really needed here is to be a real deep, real deep. Ryan is not a real deep. Ryan is very static, very passive. Ryan, are you there? Do you hear us? I am very you passive, know? static, yes. No? Yeah. I am here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but... I'm not a real I'm not even uh, in the Bucharest office anymore. Yeah, for me, that was a big. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I can't even look at Ryan's desk anymore. I can't even say that I have, we have to rearrange or something. Right. Well, having Ryan was the glue of all of us. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll discuss this uh, later. Um, yes. What is the plan now? Uh, With respect to what? The 